you very much, uh, Kate Ratcher, for, for uh, and letting me come and address you. Uh, I loved that. I agree with an awful lot of, of what you just said. And although um, what I'm going to do in my presentation, I think, does link to some of that, what I'm going to talk about a bit more is about good work. And um, that is a, a good work as a concept. And I think what I'm trying to do is if you, if you take those concepts that we just talked about just there uh, in Bill's presentation, I'm going to move that a bit more to making um, some of that fit into a managerial stru structural kind of employment sort of model. Because that's obviously my area of expertise. Um, as Kate says, I'm one of the national officers at Prospect, uh, which is a trade union. And we have quite a large number of members who work in heritage. Uh, the union itself is big, it's about 115,000 members across lots of different industries. Uh, but we have a group of members who work in the museums, in English Heritage, National Trust, all those areas that we bring together within our heritage group. One of those branches, of course, is our archaeology branch, which is made up of lots of reps from different sections, archaeological units plus individual members. So what we do is we're a membership-based organisation and we try and represent our members, to support our members and campaign on a couple of basic principles, which is basically about respect and dignity at work, trying to make sure that we ensure that, which is why I loved that you used that word, uh, but also just a really basic principle about if you work together and support one another, that collectivism, that's really how you can make a difference. So that's, that's how we, uh, that's kind of, if you like, that's our starting point for our trade union. Now, what I wanted to make reference to, first of all, was the joint statement that was launched last year between Prospect, IFA as was, and also FAME, the Employees' Organisation, nice to see you. Uh, and, uh, I think it's important to point out that that statement was a long time coming um, and it was, it, it took a long time to get the words uh, right on the page, something that we could all be comfortable with, a very diplomatic process of getting to a point where we were all happy that we were saying the right thing in a constructive way. But a really important signal, I think, that we had all made those commitments that we wanted to come round the table and we wanted to say, look, at the end of the day, we've all got a different agenda, but what we're all about is about archaeology, and it's about improving archaeology, making sure that archaeology is sustainable, making sure that archaeology is a great profession. Uh, so where can we help each other? Because that's the end point, and we're all coming at it. So where can we help each other to get to that point? Uh, so that was really great that we were able to do that. Um, and. I think it's important to say that I started this job within the heritage part of Prospect uh, nearly two years ago um, and I very quickly became up to speed with some of the issues in archaeology and it felt all very urgent to me and there were a huge amount of issues that needed to be addressed uh, for our union. So then when I started going back through the files, I found, for example, the APPG report talking about how urgent it was to review salary levels and pay in archaeology, it, it written in 2003 and I thought, oh my God. That was urgent and 10 years have gone past and I could kind of launch the same report right now. You know, and I know that Kate and others in IFA did a huge amount of work in 2008, a global economic recession, disaster, all of that stuff. And I think that, you know, that was the kind of the, the backdrop really about where we then came together to say, right, come on, let's, we really need to get around the table and focus on how we're going to do this. So I think that that's, um, you know, that was a really important and very quite a, you know, a significant step for us to work in that way. As I say, very carefully worded, very diplomatic. So I've very clumsily summarised it on the next slide, which you shouldn't read too closely, especially perhaps you two. But uh, just a quick, uh, there's a kind of quick summary of some of the main points there about what we were trying and I think promising to do. We talked about skills, about the standards of professional practice. We talked about rewarding those skills appropriately, promoting archaeology as a highly skilled profession, including quality and value in client choice. So more than, if you like, you know, where is the where is the most uh, the, the cheap option, and of course ensuring employees are informed about their employment rights and particularly their right to join a trade union. So from Prospect's point of view, I mean, as I say, everybody has their different their different take and their different priority <coughs> angles on there. But, um, I, perhaps I should have used the stick, from our point of view, it was really about trying to make sure that we develop the best paying conditions, the best training, the best CPD, to universally make a better employment offer. 
And I really think that that's really so important in archaeology. And I say that because I've represented members. I've been an official at this union since 1999, and I've, I've worked in lots of different industries. Uh, so it was a shock, really, for me to come across to archaeology to understand some of the employment challenges that were still going on that actually from the outside, from an outsider's point of view, you might not have recognised that some of those challenges were there. So um, a lot of the negative stuff that we talk about these days, about low pay, about job insecurity, about zero hours contracts, all of those things, I don't think that's acceptable for an employment offer. And it's certainly not acceptable in an employment offer for archaeology in a profession such as this. So our agenda is very much about moving away from some of that kind of low, common, uh, low cost, lowest common denominator employment practice and pushing it up. And I want to give you a model for that today, which is the good work agenda. The reason I think this is important is because it's my view that if you can grow good work and good employment practice, and push good employment and good employment practice across the whole of archaeology. It is that by uh, which that you will have the better training and the better CPD. It is that by which you'll have better motivated employees. You'll, that, that's the way to grow, if you like, that expertise in the profession. And that is what's good for archaeology. So I really think whatever it is that you decide on the charter, uh, really having good employment practice <coughs> is essential for the profession. Right, I'm going to just talk you through. That's the uh, the good work slide. So this is I don't know if anyone's ever come across good work as a concept before. It's an idea that we've stolen, as all the best ideas, I think. Uh, it emerged first of all in the 70s in Sweden from a, a trade union congress in Sweden. But lots and lots more people are talking about this now. And again, it goes to the Maslow. I mean, we haven't talked before, but we, this I you know there was a lot of a lot of synergy here because um, lots and lots of uh, measures are being you know, developed these days really to talk about what is good work and, and how can you measure it. And there are German studies about having an index. What we've done with our model is kind of try and take bits and pieces of all of the different ideas out there, but we've also used the health and, sta uh, health and safety executive management standards. And they talk a lot these days about the concepts that I'm gonna talk you through here today. Uh, and they show that if you can manage employment in this way, this is how you get the best from people, but it's also about how you keep people healthy. Uh, and it's about how, you know, the challenge of the modern life and how you really need a good employment structure to make sure that it's better than just offering that, that very basic level employment contract. So, I mean, inspired a bit by the negativity, but it's about good business sense. It's about making things worthwhile. And it's about being very responsible as an employer. So it's basically several, several different sections which are, it'll be broken down into. So the first concept is this, secure, interesting and fulfilling jobs. Touched on this again in the last presentation because uh, we talked about uh, losing, not losing the passion for history. We talked about CPD. All of those things really kind of fit in here about having that proper development of, of an individual's career. And that is essential. It is, it's essential for, for your well-being, for how you feel valued by your employer, how you, you know, that, that sense of getting out of bed in the morning, all of that stuff. And it's about employers making sure that you can understand what are your individual skills and expertise and passion of your employees and making sure that you are able to develop that and tap into it. It's about giving people meaningful purpose. And I think that that's really important in heritage and particularly in archaeology because, of course, that growing, particularly if you're you know, trying to access any kind of public funding, that growing pressure on being able to develop and demonstrate within the community the, the, you know, the, the value that you're adding to the local community all sits in that. So allowing individuals who work for you to understand, this is my job, this is where it fits in, this is our vision, this is what we're doing in our employer, this is what, where it all fits together. That's all really, really important. So understanding that, having those clear processes about your job and where it fits in are really, really important. So that's the first element. The next one is a trust and fairness-based culture. I would say that, wouldn't I? I'm a trade union official. But, uh, you know, very, very important. It comes, comes through very, very clearly from the health and safety executive standards as well. And it's really about just making sure that you have a check in your employment practice about making sure that you haven't got stupid rules, 
things make sense, that you're doing stuff, that people can understand what the rules of engagement are, that you've got a real open and honest culture, and that's where you know information can flow up and down the organisation. Uh, I think there's clearly uh, an importance about diversity in there, about building different teams and making sure that you're just not doing like, recruiting like, that people can voice their opinion about their workplace without fear of negative repercussions in that. It's really about being treated like a grown-up, isn't it? I think it comes back to that trust and respect at work that we talked about earlier on. So trust and fairness, culturally so important for a good employer. This is an interesting one, and I think growing choice and control over hours, it makes me think about Ed Miliband saying exploitative contracts, because someone will say, oh, I like my zero hours contract, perhaps. Uh, so choice, I think, is increasingly important. I think in the, you know, this is another thing about the modern world of work, people juggling children, childcare, and elderly parents increasingly, and a number of us squeezed at both ends. Uh, with you know demands at both ends of our family tree on that scale, but I think it's also about uh, you know having a grown-up relationship with your staff. It's about being uh, flexible when and where people need it. It's about being open to people having different demands at different points in their life, and uh, you know avoiding clock watching and presenteeism, which is actually soul destroying over after a period of time. Uh, so again, it's just about grown-up culture. Hopefully quite a lot of this is common sense, but I'll just walk you through the few, few more of them. Reward and effort in balance. <coughs> Again, very much speaks to what we were talking about on the last slide with the, with the Maslow stuff, because uh, certainly our experience in research kind of talks about um, pay, uh, pay and reward structures as the plumbing. It's quite a good analogy if you think about it. No one ever says, oh, the toilet's uh, working really well, and I washed my hands and the water came out the tap. That was very, you just assume that's going to work. That's, that's the deal. You go to the bathroom, it's all going to work. If it doesn't work, you get it wrong, that's a complete disaster and everybody knows about it. And that's the same with pay. As you say, it's not an inspirational thing necessarily. People don't work harder. As we know, I think the bankers have rather underlined that point for us. Uh, that's not necessarily uh, something you can... Uh, you can guarantee, but certainly if it's not right, if you're getting the pay structure wrong, if there is unfair pay, that's the kind of stuff that very quickly becomes a demotivator and very quickly becomes an issue that you know about and you need to resolve. So I think having um, decent reward and also fair reward, but also that equal pay, because in, you know, in days of pay stagnation, and my God, aren't we in those, are not they lasting a long time? But uh, you know the the ability to have people catch up with their colleagues who are doing the same kind of work, that is becoming harder and harder and harder. And uh, I think that those justifications really do need to be looked at very carefully. So, equal pay and a fair uh, and open uh, pay structure is is so important. And also, I think it it does speak to progression. I, I think people need clear ideas about how they do progress through those salaries. Uh, what do they need to do? What does good look like? Where do you go next? So um, the degree and control over pace of work is really, um, first of all, about job design. It's about making sure that jobs are designed in a way that is clear, fit for purpose, able to be done within the hours of that uh, employment contract. And I think first class health uh, and safety is so important in archaeology. You will all know that um, you know, much better than I. But what I think I'm trying to talk through here is that health and safety in 2015 is much more than um, you know, hazards in the workplace and all the rest of it. It is about good management. It's also about looking after welfare and it's a bit of mental health as well. And it's a bit of making sure that people uh, understand how they fit into the rest of it and that sense of fairness and that sense of where does my work fit and that sense of flexibility and all of those other um, elements that, that fit into this. And that's really how you uh, deal with absence management and all the rest of it, which are increasing, increasing employment issues within the UK. And this really, getting this right, helps to eliminate some of those challenges. So the employee voice, this is another huge part of, uh, I think, being in a good workplace because you genuinely need to engage with staff, with employees, with teams. That open culture is obviously a huge part of that, hugely important. Uh, Obviously, you know, it depends what you use in terms of a structure to make sure that you're engaging with your employees properly. But uh, we were talking earlier on, um, Andrew and I, before this started, that, uh, you know, the reason that this is so important is because it works when times are good as well as when times are bad, you know, because we talked about pay 
and that how that's a motivator or not you know what if you've got that that very open mature dialogue with your employees and times are very tough if you're having that very honest discussion that people will understand that and come with you you know if you if you've got fairness and and consistency in the policies in which you're using if there's a redundancy selection exercise or you know about who's being promoted the unfairness in that really does sit and takes a long time to unpick but if you get those things right in the first place and you have a genuine dialogue and you have genuine exchange from top to bottom on good news and bad news and ideas and what's happening and challenges and all the rest of it that really is how you bring your employees with you how you maintain motivation even when there are tough times now obviously you know you can find different structures to organize the employee voice uh, i understand that other trade unions are available so uh, you can uh, make your own choice on that but certainly we would always argue that uh, having a trade union is an excellent way of, of um, providing that employee voice because of that independent support and advice that we would give to our reps to make sure that they're trained, to make sure they're confident, to make sure that they're supported. So that is why I would always argue for a trade union structure in any workplace too. So that is the basics of, uh, of all of the uh, all of the elements, if you like, of, about good work. I think that's the model that's out there. And as I say, this pulls together health and safety management standards and plus all those other kind of measures that are out there about what is it that's good work? What does that look like? How does a modern employment contract look? Um, I think that um, there is obviously a challenge for prospect in that. And in terms of holding up our end of the joint statement, this is the kind of approach that we are pushing. That's our agenda. Uh, but I know we need to do more to make ourselves you know, more accessible and all the rest of it. And I, I certainly read uh, the Badger Facebook site often enough to know of the faults of prospect. And we try and respond to these, to these issues. But I think the importance of this kind of model is really about if you want to push up the standards and the standing of the profession, you have to have a decent employment offer. And it has to be better than it is in so many cases at the moment. It's not acceptable to have short termism. It's not acceptable to uh, give people short notice to move from one location to another. It's not acceptable to not be paying people consistently and all the rest of it. And I have too many examples of that still happening in archaeology. So our, our challenge, if you like, back to uh, you know, the employers here and also you know, the individuals among you is to say that we ought to demand more from this. We ought to, I mean, again, you know, Bill, you talked about uh, demanding respect. That's certainly our view that people ought to be saying, you know, are we all helping each other in this? You know, if you're a member of Prospect, then talk to your colleagues about being a member of Prospect. Demand good work. Talk to your your managers and your employers about how that employee voice is heard and whether or not, and have a check. You know, are you following all of this? Are we being the best that we can be? And it's that excellence, I think, about offering a modern employment offering for archaeologists that I believe if that's universal and if everyone is pushing up rather than levelling down and pushing standards down or trying to do it cheaply or cut corners in order to be competitive, that is I think um, not helping the profession in any way in terms of raising its standards and its quality and its standing. So uh, our challenge is to, to demand that people plan better to respect more, to do more best practice, and to argue for that, to have good archaeological organisations, good archaeological units, and I think that's better in terms of uh, the profession. So that is where we would we would suggest that we move in that direction. And that's it from me.